Uh, my name is Maude Barlow. I'm the uh, chairperson of a, a national social and environmental justice organization in Canada called the Council of Canadians. And we came together in 1985 to fight the very first of these bad modern free trade agreements called the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, which then morphed into NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. We were one of the, the groups that led the fight against the multilateral agreement on investment. We're very involved in trade agreements right now, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is not dead, don't think it is, um, and um, the agreements between Europe and um, North America and so on. And I've written a number of books and reports on, on trade. And I just, my case here this today is that I want to I want, we've had very powerful presentations here um, over these two days. <clears throat> and I want to make some links uh, around international policy and policies of our government that I believe are making it very difficult for us to fight and win these individual cases. And I think we need to realize that the neoliberal agenda of privatization and deregulation and handing over to the market of all decisions and to corporations of all decisions of our lives is part of the problem that we all collectively have, no matter where we come from. So my case is really that modern free trade and investment agreements um, give transnational corporations uh, the right and the ability to challenge government laws that should be protecting Mother Earth. And that they make it almost impossible for citizens and their governments to fulfill their responsibility um, to uh, climate change commitments. It's, it's like there's the, re the, the agreement that was made in Paris is over here and the, trans and, the, and the free trade agreements that are being negotiated are over here and they're on, they're on totally different paths. Uh, but it's very important to realize that the path that has the, the, the enforcement mechanism are the trade and investment <laughs> agreements. Um, today's free trade agreements differ from former trade agreements, which were about more about taking down tariffs in goods. Transnational corporations want three things, basically, from these trade agreements. They want the right to move production to low-wage countries, uh, and or to countries that uh, ignore, perhaps, or have been forced to ignore environmental concerns, uh, and they don't want to pay a penalty back in their own home country. They want to get rid of export controls on natural resources because they want access to the whole world's minerals, fish, forests, energy, and water. And they want the right to challenge government's actual right to regulate the laws and, and, that protect both human rights and, uh, and our environment and Mother Earth, and they want the right to basically force these down to the lowest common standards. And they're very open in the language that they use in wanting this. I pose to you today that modern free trade and investment agreements give them all of these privileges. They say that export and trade rules must not be more trade restrictive than is necessary. They give corporations a seat at the table to establish common regulations and standards. <clears throat> when they were looking at the industrialized wealthy countries were looking at the multilateral agreement and investment in the 1990s, I discovered through um, freedom of information in our country that our government who said there was no such thing as a multilateral agreement and investment had been meeting with our corporate and industry sector for three years. And in fact, the, uh, the agreement was very advanced. We got this, I got it, the information in a brown paper bag and we said, you lied to us and you've been, not only did you lie to us, but you've been meeting with the corporations and they literally write the agreements. Corporations make it, these trade agreements make it very difficult to introduce new standards and regulations that corporations don't want. It's called the chill effect. And governments talk to their trade experts and say, this new rule that we want to bring in, is this going to be trade compatible under our obligations? And very often the answer is no. You'll never get away with bringing in this new rule. And most importantly, these modern free trade and investment agreements give foreign corporations and foreign investors the right to sue governments if their rules um, and regulations interfere with what these corporations consider to be their right to profit. I'm going to give you several examples, one from the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is the longest serving of these um, multilateral uh, trade agreements. 
uh, we signed in Canada a proportionality agreement, basically giving away our sovereign right to decide what to do with oil and gas and energy. This meant that we have to continue to give uh, a certain amount of our energy to the United States uh, in perpetuity. And that means that we can't bring in the kind of legislation that we need to deal with the growing concern around the Alberta tar sands. And if any of you have ever had a chance to visit them, you'll see that you feel like you're on a moonscape, only it smells terrible and the water is absolutely poison. It's one of the biggest industrial projects in the world. And we can't shift our, our policy to say, let's move away from fossil fuels and fracking to something else because we're locked into this. Now with the renegotiation of NAFTA, Mexico is saying they want to come in and sign a proportionality agreement too. And this means that North America, no matter whether it's Trump signing a Paris or my government signing it, it doesn't matter if they're in or out, they won't be able to meet those commitments because they will be committing North America to a fossil fuel future. And you need to know that chill effect is already in place in Europe. Um, uh, with the Canada-European agreement, uh, there's a, a CETA it's called, uh, when it was being negotiated, the European Union was looking at downgrading the tar sands imports, the oil from the Alberta tar sands as being environmentally bad. Um, but the former government threatened to pull out of this trade agreement, so the European Union gave in, and so now these inferior, dangerous um, uh, energy uh, imports are coming into Europe. NAFTA also gave us, and this is the most important thing really about these trade agreements, something called ISDS. This is called Investor State Dispute Settlement. And this gives what they gave for the first time the right for corporations to directly sue the governments of other countries for laws that they don't like. Canada has been sued under NAFTA many, many times. We've paid American corporations over $200 million. We're currently facing $2.6 billion worth of challenges from American corporations who don't like our environmental rules, and two-thirds of them are about the environment, such as um, the province of Quebec uh, put a moratorium on fracking under the St. Lawrence River in a very fragile area. Uh, we're being sued by an American, actually it's a Canadian energy company, through their subsidiary in the United States, and so on. But it's not just in, in NAFTA. Now, NAFTA was the first of these agreements. There are now over 3,500 bilateral investment agreements that give corporations the right to sue each other. And we're, we're knowing that what's happening is that rich corporations from rich countries are laying most of the challenges um, and nearly bankrupting poor countries. A recent uh, study found that the uh, biggest wins go to corporations worth over $10 billion. So you're talking here about big corporations from wealthy countries having the ability to use these trade and investment agreements to bring poor countries to their knees. Uh, mining companies, as an example, have used this investor state right to sue over 40 countries more than 100 times. In two-thirds of these cases, governments either had to pay up, sometimes up to almost a billion dollars, or they have to, they just back off and say, okay, we'll, we'll give in and you can do what you want, and they, they weaken their environmental laws. In the 44 mining cases pending right now, mining corporations are seeking over $53 billion from mostly poor countries around the world. And I'm very embarrassed to say that many of those mining companies are registered in my country, Canada. I want to make the point that these investor state rules are binding. The Paris Accord is not binding. No environmental or human rights agreement that our government sign with each other at the United Nations or anywhere else have the authority. Those are um, ethical agreements that our governments make, but uh, they know there's nobody coming in to make them uh, do what they said they would do, right? But with these trade and investment agreements, there are enforcement provisions that are extremely powerful and extremely strong, and it's very important that we understand that these trade and, and, and investment agreements have taken precedence they're the big guys on the block, and they are powerful, and they are a, uh, a very important uh, enemy to uh, fulfilling the agreements that we make in other areas. Finally, I want to say that corporate-driven free trade agreements are based on the growth imperative, and it's very important for us to know this. And that, in turn, leads to more fossil fuels, more logging, more manufacturing, more mining, more chemical-based industrial agriculture, 
more commodity exports, more highways and trucks, and more energy pipelines, and more shipping. In other words, the whole notion of unlimited growth and unlimited stuff is the basis of these agreements and getting governments and people out of the way so that the, this growth can take place and can be uh, governed by corporations is the, is the end goal. And it is the enemy of what we're trying to do here in protecting Mother Earth. Just one last example that water is dramatically at risk. Um, there's a world-class group of scientists at the University of Twente in the Netherlands and they've just put out a report saying that uh, they've, direct, they've directly linked free trade to the devastation of water around the world, and we are a planet running out of accessible water. More than one-fifth of the world's water supplies now go to export-oriented commodities and um, uh, crops. Uh, and basically, that, that this growth imperative is part of the issue that we need to deal with as we face a world running out of water. So judges, I would say that the free trade and investment agreements being promoted by our governments, by the World Trade Organization, by the World Bank, and other international institutions are dangerous to the planet. They're incompatible with the need to fight climate destruction. We need new kinds of trade agreements, new kinds of investment agreements that, that replace these agreements, and the rights of citizens and their governments to protect Mother Earth uh, and all life that depends on our planet must be at the absolute core of a new set of trade agreements. I want to say that much work has been done and I've, I've uh, given a, a, a longer presentation to the judges and we'll have this up on, on, on the website. But much work has been done on alternatives and what we could be looking for and I want to say this is a moment in time when we really as a movement can come together and, and particularly demand that corporations not have the power they have through this ISDS, this right to sue. This is a moment a number of governments are saying, I really think maybe I should back off. Brazil is not signing any agreements with investor rights. New Zealand's got a new prime minister that says no to this. Australia, um, India's got very deep concerns and so on. We have a moment here. And I have, so I have to say that what I want for us, of course, is to be promoting um, uh, with our governments and these institutions uh, a different kind of, of trading system because I think that the work that we're all trying to do here that's been presented is going to be much more difficult if we don't get rid of them. Uh, but I also want to say, final word, is that our movement needs to become more trade literate. There was a time when we knew more about it, but we've gotten back into our individual cases. We know a great deal about climate change and not so much now about how these international institutions and policies um, make it very difficult for us to do our work. And I think it's timely. I don't think we can be politically literate or economically literate unless we're trade literate. <laughs> so that's my presentation. And I'm going to be inviting um, several, uh, an expert witness and, and several uh, impact witnesses. I'm going to uh, uh, call, just introduce them, and then um, Madam Prosecutor will, will call them. York Haas, who's a climate and trade expert with the Heinrich Boll Foundation. We've also got Anidhi Vali Malkaena, who's a gender uh, a Southern Africa woman for climate change, and Makoma Lekala Kala with Earth Life Africa. And they're going to come up and present together. And then we have Jesus <coughs> Vasquez Negron, who's with La Via Capucina from Puerto Rico, who will be speaking in Spanish. So I thank you very much for your time and attention. Hello, I'm Jörg Haas. I am working for the Heinrich Böll Foundation, which is a green political foundation here in Germany. Um, I'm working on trade and environment issues for oh yeah, more than a decade. And in the past couple of years, I've been working for Campact in the context of the TTIP and CETA campaign, so I've been dealing with these issues uh, also in a, in a previous job. Um, yes, and I want to, to go a little bit more into depth into one specific aspect of uh, what uh, Maud has been saying. Oops, I'm not entirely sure how this is advancing. Yes, and it's about the investor state dispute settlement um, procedures that are enshrined in these trade agreements. What I'm showing you here is um, a very big uh, power plant, a coal-fired power plant, which 
uh, has been built in Hamburg in Germany. So, you know, always Germany, that famous climate champion. You have it, it, this, um, this power plant has been uh, built in the, you know, from 2007 until 2014. And it has been heavily challenged by opposition uh, from environmental groups, from the Green Party. There was a, a big fight around it. Um, the Greens made a big pledge in their local campaign for uh, the mayor you know, uh, of Hamburg and for, for the Senate of Hamburg for the local parliament. And they were actually then um, able to form a coalition. And uh, so a Green person became the environment minister of Hamburg and this uh, denied uh, the permit to withdraw water for uh, the power plant um, as it, you know, the company had applied for, for that right. And the company didn't go to the German court, it did go to an international tribunal under a treaty called the Energy Charter, which is another kind of energy-specific uh, in, uh, investment agreement. And uh, this is... Um, is led uh, at the end to uh, a settlement. Um, this is the, the result of that um, peaceful settlement, but the basic result was, I mean, it was, the claim was 1.9 billion of uh, indemnization. They, you know, the case was settled without any payment, but the result was that the company got its way. It could, uh, it could essentially, you know, got the right to water. The interesting bit in this case is that later on, <laughs> Germany, got sued under the European environmental law for not fulfilling its obligation under the Habitat Directive. So, you know, now it's, now it's Germany's non-compliant with European environmental law because it has been essentially allowing this company to get its way. It's kind of a contradiction between the jurisdiction of uh, this uh, international um, uh, arbitral tribunal that uh, essentially forced its way into the, the, the um, you know, German law and uh, the European Court of Justice, and this is quite remarkable. Um, another case is quite, uh, has already been mentioned by uh, Maud, uh, it's uh, Long Pine Resources, uh, a company, uh, actually a Canadian company which, which has a US subsidiary which was essentially uh, suing Canada um, and uh, for fracking rights in uh, Quebec. There was a ban after a lot of campaigning, a lot of uh, obviously opposition against fracking, uh, and uh, the, the fracking rights were denied. Uh, Long Pine Resources was suing, and it's uh, it's or is still suing, uh, 241 million US dollars for compensation. The case is still pending, so we don't know. Uh, maybe uh, Canada will win and get away. That's fine, but it's uh, already a threat uh, for for Canada. Um, another case, um, probably well known to many of you because it has been quite prominent in the US, um, the battle around the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, I mean, a lot of protests, civil disobedience, you know about it. It has been really an a, a, a internationally well known uh, battle. People have been fighting very hard for years. At the end, Obama has, den has been denying the company TransCanada the right to build the Keystone XL pipeline. And um, again, the company has been filing uh, a claim uh, uh, with the International Arbitral Tribunal for 15 billion US dollar. Now, the whole uh, case is in some way moot because um, Trump has uh, now allowed the pipeline to go forward. So, you know, in that case, it wasn't necessary for the tribunal to intervene. So it's it's. Uh, um, is withdrawn uh, that claim, but still it shows that even the US is not immune for this kind of uh, investor claims in international tribunals. Another case um, actually from Ecuador and from a place that I know from my own experience, I've been working in Ecuador from 1990 to 1992, so, and in uh, the province of Sucumbios, the northern part of the Ecuadorian Amazon, Texaco has been extracting petroleum there for decades, since uh, the early 70s. You know that much better than I <laughs> about it. So uh, you should be speaking about that, not me. Uh, but uh, the case is in, uh, and I have been uh, seeing situations like this, you know, there's a lot of oil pollution uh, in the rainforest. It's a terrible situation. 
There has been um, a, a case brought forward under Ecuadorian law against Chevron, the company that essentially bought Texaco, uh, you know, to, to pay uh, for uh, the, the damage done. There has been uh, actually uh, an award under Ecuadorian law for billions of indemnization against Chevron. Now, Chevron has been countering that um, that uh, uh, jurisdiction and, and uh, of uh, Ecuadorian uh, 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 Ecuadorian courts, and the interesting um, bit is it's still pending. But the, the interesting bit is that there have been interim decisions against Ecuador. So the Interesta State Tribunal in this case has granted several of Chevron's requests. One is it has ordered Ecuador's government to violate its own constitution and block enforcement of a ruling upheld on appeal in its independent court system. It's quite amazing that this international tribunal has gone above the uh, uh, Ecuadorian court system. And it also, uh, the tribunal uh, interpreted the Ecuadorian constitution and uh, a, different uh, uh, um, a different interpretation than the Ecuadorian High Court that had right to interpret the constitution and declared that the rights granted by Ecuadorian law actually did not exist. So this is uh, a quite amazing case, again, how an international tribunal of three corporate lawyers essentially supersedes national legislation and uh, uh, national legal systems. The case is still pending. Um, the whole system is uh, rapidly expanding. Uh, it's actually quite frightening. It's a statistic how uh, how many ISDAs cases are uh, you know being launched. And uh, while we had in the first 30 years of that IC ISDS re regime, we had just 50 cases in total. But since 2011, we have 50 cases each year, and it's going up. It's actually a whole industry now. You can invest into uh, cases, uh, ISDS cases, and get a reward by uh, some of the, you know, if you uh, you win the case or if, if a company wins the case, you get a share of the of the, um, uh, the uh, amount reward. Um, so uh, the amount of the claims is essentially unlimited. There is no upper limit, you know, how much a company can claim. And they can claim on future profits. Um, and under uh, the treaties, the investment agreements that the US has concluded alone, governments in total have been ordered to pay nearly 4.5 billion in compensation. And there are still 58 billion uh, remain pending. So it's quite a, a, a significant threat. Um, I think we can actually uh, stop this. Uh, Mort has already said that there is a growing opposition. Many countries are starting to review their investment agreements. And I think our movement has made uh, great progress in the context of the opposition to TTIP. And we just need to revitalize that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Rivida Mugwena, and I'm from Gender CC Southern Africa, Women for Climate Justice in Johannesburg. Um, I am here to to voice the to 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 voice the struggles of the grassroots women, especially small-scale farmers and uh, who are affected by gender blind and gender insensitive climate change policies and also the um, industrial um, agriculture system that is taking, taking place in our country. Um, since 2016, the representatives of the South African government have frequently used the term radical economic transformation and the term was met with some speculation as to what this would actually mean. Then in May this year, the Competition Commission approved the Bayer and Monsanto merger. This was the third merger in the agricultural sector to be approved by the Commission. These measures give power to the few corporations within South Africa, 
in the name of um, radical e economic transformation, our government is allowing and supporting the merger of super huge corporations like Monsanto and Bayer to take control of the seed market in the country. They bring genetically modified seeds through agrochemicals and together they control 60% of the seed market uh, globally. And now what does this rhetoric mean for smallholder farmers and the political economy within the seed sector in our country? Monsanto promotes itself as a sustainable agriculture company. They claim that in agriculture, we need to scale up the use of chemicals and technologies such as genetically engineered to feed a growing global population, claiming that 800 million people in the world are chronically, are chronically hungry. Um, as consumers, I think we have the right to know what is it that we're putting in our bodies. And what type of system do our money is our money used to support? Monsanto owns the seed and the biotechnology, the GMOs, which um, is sold to the government, who provide them to small-scale farmers as inputs um, subsidies. Um, the fact are that the industrial agricultural system are often referred to as conventional agriculture. But a more appropriate term would be the compensation agriculture. As we find the use of these chemicals and synthetic fertilizers and genetic engineering that they are used to compensate for the problems that we have created or their corporations themselves and our government have created. Um, Monsanto also claims that the increase in monocropping and genetic engineering is the cure that is actually, but that is actually not a cure, it is a disease to our society and to our um, nature. This, they state that the drought tolerant maize is already improving, improving lives in Africa. Engineering drought tolerance seeds while ignoring sustainable solutions to mitigate the effects of climate change. I think that is being short-sighted and being misguided. In fact, it, uh, um, it is the lack of diversity rather than the lack of food which is causing major problems within the human and environmental health. Current industrialized food production system is estimated to be responsible for upwards of 50% of all greenhouse gas emissions, as reported by the Wall Street Journal. The corporations defend and promote industrial agriculture by claiming that it feeds people. But the main aim of the industrial agriculture is not feeding the world population, it is profits. Um, Damage and restoration to um, the industrial agriculture, remedies like the agroecology, which strives to design an agricultural system and it works in harmony with nature and the ecolog ecological system. In 2011, the United States reports um, that the benefit of agroecology, if sufficiently supported, can double food production in the entire region within 10 years while mitigating climate change and alleviating poverty. Um, also some remedies that are used locally, um, there is an integrated pest management strategy which is used to eliminate the need for using toxic chemicals. And also it's um, healing the soil in um, eliminating the need for using synthetic fertilizers. It also helps in managing water harvesting and um, mitigating the effects of droughts. And um, people at local level, they use the traditional and indigenous knowledge of uh, mulching, 
um, using intercropping and also um, using some traditional mixtures as pest repellent rather than using um, the chemical um, pest repellents. Um, yes, there are better solutions to, to sustainable solutions to mitigate the effects of climate change. Um, as I have mentioned, the others, there's also the tradition, the traditional open pollination of seeds, which is used and um, it has naturally drought uh, tolerant seeds. The seed bank, saving of seeds and sharing of seeds from different region and um, different uh, uh, climate uh, regions. Now to achieve a true green revolution, we need to learn how to work with nature and not against nature. And it is important for the voices of civil society and grassroots communities to be heard within the policy lawmaking arena in South Africa. The South African way is to look to the state to deliver on action to prevent cooperation expansion and to develop alternatives that are not harmful to the nature and also to the communities. Um, this is even part of the narrative of the South African Freedom Charter, which says that the land and wealth shall belong to all. Uh, finally, um, some of the alternatives which will help small-scale farmers is to decentralize large-scale farmers and empower the small-scale farmers. Agroecology is the way to solve problems of harm and climate crisis and also cooling the planet. The goal of agroecology is to feed all nations with healthy food while caring for Mother Earth and attempting to solve the climate crisis. Also, the heritage variety of crops have more res resilience to drought and other factors than the monocropping system of the industrial agriculture. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for giving me um, this opportunity to be able to share uh, this case with you. I think it's of greater concern not only to us as South Africans, but all over the world. My name is Mako Malgaradala, and I'm from Earthlife Africa, Johannesburg. Thank you, and um, please uh, tell us about your own experience as an impacted person impacted by uh, trade agreements and these large corporations. Um, firstly, I think uh, for us now is that uh, we are experiencing a new form of colonialism. The colonialism that is being facilitated through a, a trade agreements, uh, trade agreements either from different countries, either from Western and Southern countries or Southern, Southern, Northern Belgium. So this has impacted on us negatively. And um, that having impacted on us negatively, uh, South Africa has signed an intergovernmental agreement with, uh, with Russia. Um, this is an, inter, an, an ongoing intergovernmental agreement. But however, on that, uh, on, they have signed a trade agreement, an ongoing trade agreement with South Africa. But of concern, it's one uh, of the of concern. It's a it's an intergovernmental agreement that uh, South Africa and Russia have signed around 2014. And this intergovernmental uh, agreement involves uh, nuclear energy. They have signed an intergovernmental agreement on nuclear cooperation. But however, this intergovernmental agreement of nuclear cooperation have actually threatened the governance of South Africa. This international um, uh, inter intergovernmental uh, agreement with South Africa have also have threatened energy democracy. That means ordinary people, citizens of South Africa, uh, have got no right to take part in decision making to decide uh, what sort of energy would they choose. Uh, decisions have been made, intergovernmental agreements have been signed, and the South African government has made commitments to those intergovernmental agreements. When the agreement came to fall, um, that uh, 
members of uh, civil society in Russia who are part of the Don't Lose Climate campaign, uh, Eco Defense, uh, when they highlighted that, they used to say this is an intergovernmental agreement that has been signed with South Africa. And uh, there are points on that intergovernmental agreement that says that uh, this uh, uh, Russia is like being favored because that was the recent agreement that has been signed. South Africa has signed intergovernmental agreements with other countries before, but this one was recent. It was much more detailed than the other ones. And one, one factor was that in case, so that means that uh, the violation of the rights of Mother Earth were seen that this is something that can happen, potentially can happen. So the agreement indicated that uh, in case of, uh, of an accident, uh, or something goes wrong with the construction of the reactors, uh, Rosatom or Russia would not be responsible for that. So that would be the responsibility of South Africa. And that was a kind of a, con a real great concern for us as to how really uh, do our governments agree to this. And uh, was it an oversight that they didn't see that is that the most danger point? But however, since then, we have seen moves by the South African government trying to sell to us um, that they, we don't have energy, we don't have energy security in the country, and that they would like to increase you know, the energy security in the country by expanding uh, the nuclear uh, percentage in the energy mix of the country. And uh, when they sold that to us, they said that uh, nuclear, it's carbon neutral, has got no emission, and uh, this is the best sort of energy that you can have, and uh, it's not expensive. But uh, contrary to that, also because this is an energy technology that has been used in other countries, uh, we were informed. But as, as organizations and as citizens of the country, we wanted answers from the government as to why are they so eager to um, build these nuclear reactors. Um, but we understood that they were influenced by these uh, trade agreements and they cannot detach themselves from the trade agreements and the intergovernmental um, uh, agreements that they've done with other countries. Um, there are reports that we have in the country from the Centre for Scientific Industrial Research and uh, the University of, of Cape Town that it actually had said that uh, we cannot afford um, nuclear energy and would rather invest more in renewable energy technologies because this will provide electricity for those who are living in energy poverty. But however, this is being disregarded. And as the intergovernmental agreement, and, and we saw that the government is eager to um, pursue building these nuclear reactors, as civil society, because we've got a right under the Constitution of South Africa to, to know as to what really is happening. We asked for questions, we asked questions, we requested answers, we couldn't get to them. So we are forced to use the courts of South Africa um, to file a case against um, the departments of energy, the state president, and several departments, institutions within the government sector, because we felt that they are abdicating their duties. Um, they have to share information with us, and we also have the right to take part in decision-making processes as to what sort of um, energy-based load or security we would want to see. Um, so we filed a case in 2015. Uh, because our colleagues in the Don the Climate Campaign had uh, given us information on the, in, in 2014 and we, 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 were, we followed that up and we never got answers but we were sure that uh, the government has already started in procurement of nuclear energy which we know is, uh, uh, has got an element of corruption and besides that element of corruption it also threatens uh, the governance system Today, the South African political governance system is in tatters. There's, uh, it's, it's so much confusion that we, don't, we no longer understand what actually is happening, uh, or which door would you knock so that you can get answers. And it's due to this nuclear intergovernmental um, agreement on nuclear cooperation with Russia that had started all this, because we knew the, 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 the history of, of, of nuclear energy uh, is embedded in, or it's rooted in corruption, but not only in corruption, it's also rooted in human rights violation and environmental racism. Um, when we went to court, we had concerns that uh, nuclear energy is too dirty, that uh, the nuclear reactors and the nuclear fuel chain um, produce vast amounts of lethal radioactive waste, that is dangerous, 
um, that uh, if we continue to use or if we invest in um, uh, or if the country builds new nuclear reactors, this may inevitably lead to more Fukushima's, uh, more church rocks and more Chernobyl's. And uh, this accidents, we know that they have, uh, nuclear accidents, we know that they have shaken us as, as, as people of the world and we, 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 we are very cautious and always afraid that uh, if anything happens, that means it means the destruction of, of the planet as it is. But then the technology and materials needed to need and uh, needed to, new, to, to, to generate nuclear energy, um, they can also be diverted into nuclear weapons, and this is not something that uh, uh, anybody would want to be associated with. Nuclear is very expensive. Um, um, it's the most costliest uh, possible mean of reducing carbon emissions. Um, and with the South African case, the estimation as to when we build the nuclear reactors, how much would that be? That would be around a trillion, um, one trillion rands. I'm not sure in dollars or in euros how much that can be, but it's a huge amount. That if the South African government had said we are actually building, going ahead and building nuclear reactors, um, it would just bankrupt the country. We are already in a junk status. Our co economy is very low. Um, the other concern why we went to court we said that nuclear energy is too slow to deliver. Um, people who are born today cannot wait for 20 or 30 years to be able to have access to electricity. I mean, if I agree that, uh, that the reactor has been built today, that means I have to wait for 25 years and I may not still be alive by then. So it would be a debt that is being left for coming generations to be able to do. But the case that we have filed, we, we, the judge ruled in our favor on the 26th of April this year, and the judge said that uh, the government is acting unconstitutionally and unlawfully by going ahead and uh, um, by going ahead and procuring um, nuclear reactors without uh, following due process that is on the legislative and regulatory framework in, in our constitution. Uh, and that victory, I think that was the biggest, uh, that was one of the most important achievements um, in the environment, of, of the environmental movement in the 21st century. Because if we can take the nuclear lobby head on, that means everything is possible because we have made commitments that it is our duty to protect, um, um, to protect the planet. Um, but however, due to the clauses and commitments that South Africa has made, either on the trade deal or on the trade agreements or on the intergovernmental agreement, we have heard in the past few days that um, the Minister of Energy says, despite the court case, they are going ahead in building these new nuclear reactors. But the Minister of Finance says, we can't do that. Uh, that is, we, we cannot afford it. But we know that even if they say that there are those who've got interest in doing that, today the nuclear lobby is busy, it's also part of the UNFCCC, they lobby in different countries, and lobby in different countries also saying that nuclear is cheap, nuclear is affordable, uh, it's affordable and nuclear would deliver, uh, would, it's, it's part of the low carbon um, uh, energy choice. But we know that it's not. Um, the fuel chain, the fuel cycle, it's something that the carbon, it's not counted. The carbon intensity is not counted. So they look at the last, but they also don't look at uh, what happens to the waste. Um, the waste, it's, some, it's the most deadliest because it will remain radioactive for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, if that remains for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, that means it has got potential of just destroying, you know, Mother Earth. And Mother Earth is not going to be able to replenish itself from the dangers that are brought up by uh, the high and low um, uh, radioactive waste that comes from uh, the nuclear energy reactors. But for us, I think we have one request, and um, that request uh, it's actually a demand to say that we um, would want corporations in the world not to milk the climate, our, our governments to be responsible and not take and, and not invest in nuclear or build nuclear reactors because this is tantamount to violating human rights and also to 
um, to destroying the earth. Um, the other thing that we want is um, from these negotiations, um, the UNFCCC negotiations, nuclear, same as like in the Kyoto Protocol, should not be, it should be excluded now because we know that there's very strong lobby to say that uh, nuclear is part of the clean development mechanism, nuclear is low carbon, nuclear is the energy of the future, it's not the energy of the future, nuclear is the energy of the past, renewable energies are um, the energy of, of the future. So we don't, we would really want um, uh, nuclear to be taken out of um, uh, the, uh, the climate change convention negotiations because it is just going to reverse all the pro progress that has been made uh, throughout all these years. We actually expected to have a climate uh, change convention in the past uh, few years and uh, the reason that is being delayed, the discussions are being delayed, we understand that it's because of the nuclear lobby and also of the court. <coughs> So for us, we, I think for, for us, the remedy also, we also want the South African government to abandon um, the idea of um, increasing its energy security with um, nuclear energy because we do have a potential uh, energy based load that has, been, that has not been exploited. The other thing we also want um, the South African government and also the Russian government just to ignore, you know, um, or just to and now the agreements that have done in that way, then we'll be looking into the future and maybe annul them, but convert them into the kind of agreements that will look more into real energy sources that are low carbon and not nuclear. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Saludos a todos y todas. Mi nombre es Jesús Vázquez. Eh, vengo de Puerto Rico eh, y estamos aquí también eh, con el movimiento internacional que es la Vía Campesina. Eh, ¿Quiénes somos no? y de dónde venimos? Eh, venimos en este caso dos, una compañera y un compañero, que, ¿verdad? Estamos aquí de, de Puerto Rico, venimos de una isla, de un territorio caribeño que fue altamente impactado por el cambio climático recientemente. Eh, recibimos el impacto de dos huracanes, tuvimos el impacto de huracán María, tuvimos el impacto dos semanas después eh, de huracán María, primero fue el huracán Irma, disculpen. Y entonces pues eh, sabemos lo que es el cambio climático, sabemos que el cambio climático es real, sabemos que las aguas en el océano Atlántico, en el mar Caribe, están más calientes, sabemos que hay una responsabilidad global y por eso un poco también estamos aquí, ¿no? Eh, para atender estas situaciones, entendemos que hay continentes, espacios geográficos muchísimo más grandes, gobiernos que, son, que están altamente responsables por las emisiones, eh, de gases ¿verdad? a nivel planetario y hay comunidades y pueblos muchísimo más vulnerables especialmente aquellas comunidades y pueblos, territorios que están en el, en el, en el Caribe, Centroamérica las Islas Hermanas como Haití, Cuba, República Dominicana eh, Dominica, a, a, a hermanas antillas menores que reciben estos impactos ¿no? y un poco pues aquí vemos una delegación del movimiento internacional que es la vía campesina en la que saludo a mis compañeros y compañeras que también nos acompañan desde Brasil, desde Estados Unidos, Nicaragua, Francia, África, Zimbabue, eh, Alemania, Timor Leste, Mozambique, Bélgica y Canadá y entonces pues, pues venimos acá para, para, para dejar claro algunas cosas que tenemos que decir sobre el tema de los tratados de libre comercio y en especial las semillas. Hacemos un saludo especial tanto al tribunal como a la audiencia que nos acompaña hoy porque entendemos que esto es un tema muy importante, respetamos la madre tierra desde nuestros territorios y venimos aquí para honrar nuestras semillas. Por lo tanto, eh, hacemos ese, ese, ese hincapié y simplemente dejarles saber también que la Vía Campesina es un movimiento de millones de agricultores, campesinos, trabajadores agrícolas, pescadores, pastores, recolectores, activistas, que están en todos los, los continentes del, del planeta Tierra y que llevan luchando en contra de estos tratados de libre comercio durante muchísimos años y proponiendo lo que es una alternativa distinta. Bueno, comenzamos con... Con el tema de, de Puerto Rico, viendo un poco de lo local a lo global, 
En Puerto Rico tenemos la presencia de grandes compañías eh, que impactan todo el planeta y es importante nombrarlas. Eh, estas compañías son compañías que experimentan con transgénicos organismos genéticamente modificados. Eh, algunas de estas compañías son Bayer, Dow Agrosciences, Pioneer, Pioneer DuPont, Singenta, Monsanto. Eh, en el caso de Puerto Rico, Bayer se encuentra en el pueblo de Sabana Grande, Pioneer DuPont en los pueblos de Salinas, Santa Isabel, Guayama y Juanadía, Singenta en Juanadía y Salinas, y Monsanto en Juanadía, Santa Isabel y Isabela, entre otros. Y es importante resaltar esto. Estas compañías se organizan de una manera bastante peculiar y respondiendo a unos intereses particulares. Tenemos en la gráfica las, el, el, la, la compañía raíz y las, y las divisiones con las que ellas operan para entonces así poder seguir acaparando más territorio, mayores incentivos y podemos ver en el esquema cómo esta industria tiene diferentes ramificaciones y también reciben el apoyo directo eh, de gobiernos y estados y agencias, ¿no? En el caso de Puerto Rico, cuando les menciono los pueblos, entendemos que aquí estamos en, una, en un foro como un tribunal y nos interesa un poco adelantar también algo de la evidencia y específicamente en los pueblos donde operan estas compañías. El sur de Puerto Rico, donde vemos a, 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 al sur, Santa Isabel, Ponce, eh, hasta, hasta hacia el oeste, en esa área del sur central, tenemos los mejores terrenos agrícolas en nuestro archipiélago. Tenemos terrenos agrícolas que son muy accesibles, que tienen acuíferos, que tienen buen acceso a agua, que tienen unos suelos altamente eh, productivos. No obstante, quienes están operando en esos, en esos terrenos y en esos territorios son estas compañías que experimentan todos los días con, con, en el suelo eh, de Puerto Rico y no están ni produciendo ni alimentos, ¿no? Sabemos que hace falta producir alimentos desde el pueblo y para el pueblo y lo que hacen estas compañías es traer más contaminación, poner las comunidades que habitan cerca en alto riesgo y a la misma vez utilizar un territorio ¿no? como lo es Puerto Rico para entonces eh, seguir experimentando y exportando semillas al exterior. Es importante señalar también el contexto político de, 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 de nuestro país en Puerto Rico. Eh, nosotros tenemos una relación jurídicamente con los Estados Unidos, tenemos un contexto colonial en nuestro territorio y además de eso cuando hablamos de colonia tenemos que hablar de colonia también con la semilla. Eh, lo que están haciendo estas corporaciones, lo que hacen los tratados de libre comercio es literalmente colonizar la madre tierra, ¿no? Colonizar el agua, la tierra, el territorio y colonizarnos a nosotros mismos para volvernos dependientes de lo que ellos estén eh, promoviendo. Y entonces, además de eso, se empeora a, a, a algo más, ¿no? Y cuando hablamos del contexto de Puerto Rico lo traemos como un ejemplo porque lo vivimos, pero esto es un contexto también global. Lo que está pasando en nuestro archipiélago es muy común a lo que sufren otros países hermanos caribeños y otros países en alrededor del mundo. Entonces los incentivos, el apoyo que reciben estas compañías, en el caso de Puerto Rico estamos hablando de 519 millones en tasas contributivas preferenciales, en exenciones de impuestos, en incentivos industriales, en subsidios salariales que incluso vienen del pago de impuestos del pueblo. ¿no? Y en Puerto Rico es un caso bastante particular porque nosotros andamos en una crisis económica que fue producida por una mala administración gubernamental, por corrupción, 69 millones que debe el gobierno de Puerto Rico, en una deuda ¿verdad? que le dicen que tienen que pagar a los bonistas. No obstante, se han gastado toda esta cantidad adicional de dinero, que es muchísimo mayor, apoyando una industria que sabemos que contamina, que pone en riesgo al pueblo y que no produce alimentos, ¿no? Y para nosotros es bien importante eh, traer eso ante, ante este espacio y también queríamos aprovechar para dejar claro que en Puerto Rico tenemos una ley, ¿no? Y se llama la Ley de Promoción y Desarrollo de Empresas de Biotecnología Agrícola, aprobada en el 2009. Este es el espacio jurídico que les da un espacio abierto para que estas compañías se instalen en nuestro territorio y sigan haciendo lo que ellos están haciendo. El, además de eso, tenemos en nuestra Constitución un límite de 500 acres. 
eh, y para operar, para que toda operación agrícola lleve a cabo su trabajo, tanto extranjera como local. Y estas compañías constantemente violan ese principio, o sea, están acaparando, acaparando muchísima tierra y se están excediendo de ese límite que, es, que sabemos que, que es constitucional. Y entonces, ¿qué es lo que hacen? experimentar, experimentan con maíz, soya, algodón, sorgo, eh, 1.694 experimentos llevamos en, en nuestro territorio en Puerto Rico. 62% de los experimentos están, llevan a, tienen el, el uso de glifosato y agrotóxico, que simplemente es cómo experimentamos para que una planta resista un herbicida, ¿no? Y entonces es importante hablar sobre qué son los transgénicos, ¿no? ¿Qué son los organismos genéticamente modificados? Bueno, la definición puede ser un poco técnica, pero podemos un poco avanzar un poco con lo que hay detrás, ¿no? Y simplemente una, un transgénico, una semilla modificada, es una, es una semilla que fue intervenida genéticamente por el hombre para entonces llevar a cabo un resultado. En este caso, el resultado es que queremos un alto rendimiento, ¿no? Queremos eh, crear una planta que resista, un plaguicida que la misma compañía eh, crea para, para resolver el tema de las plagas, ¿no? Porque tenemos monocultivos, tenemos miles de cuerdas de una misma planta, la madre naturaleza no se comporta así, pues ahora tenemos que resolver un problema, tenemos que bañarla de tóxicos, ¿no? Y entonces, pues, tenemos que tener claro que los transgénicos y los organismos genéticamente modificados nunca hubiesen pasado bajo, el, bajo la intervención de, de si el hombre no hubiese intervenido, ¿no? Y eso es bien claro, la naturaleza nunca hubiese creado eh, un transgénico. Y en un tribunal como este entendemos sumamente eh, importante traer ese planteamiento, ¿no? Entonces, para entrar en el, en el tema de los tratados de, de libre comercio, los tratados de libre comercio ponen a todos los pueblos como colonias de las empresas. Fuimos colonizados por el mercado. Nos convierten en consumidores, en consumidores sobre lo que ellos producen, quitándonos el derecho a producir con nuestras semillas. Y por lo tanto, ¿qué es lo que hacen los agricultores, campesinos, trabajadores de todo el globo? Intercambiar semillas. Traer la propuesta de la agroecología, como mencionaron los compañeros de Sudáfrica. Hacer una agricultura sana, hacer una agricultura sustentable. Sabemos que las prácticas agroecológicas producen alimentos en abundancia. Sabemos que las prácticas agroecológicas protegen el ambiente y sabemos que las prácticas agroecológicas también nos organizan como comunidad. Estamos hablando de resiliencia. Nosotros recibimos un huracán muy fuerte por la isla y vimos resiliencia en las fincas cuando vamos a visitar a nuestros compañeros para empezar entonces a, a reconstruir lo que se ha caído. ¿no? Y entonces pues tener eso claro, que esto no es un invento, que esto es literalmente respetar a lo que nuestros ancestros hicieron, porque la agricultura campesina viene desde nuestros ancestros, no es nada nuevo, no es ningún término nuevo, ¿no? Y entonces, pues es muy importante para nosotros eh, tra traer, traer ese tema, ¿no? Y entonces el, el, el cambio tiene que ser sistémico, ¿no? Nosotros estamos aquí eh, también en el contexto de la COP, ¿no? Y sabemos que el cambio climático es real. Estamos tarde, estábamos tarde hace 10 años atrás. Y escuchamos los acuerdos del, de, en París, escuchamos los acuerdos que van a salir de esta COP y sabemos que el año que viene vamos, vamos a estar aquí otra vez, ¿no? Por lo tanto, no pueden ser meros ajustes. No podemos depender que, que haya una buena voluntad pero el año que viene no se cumpla, ¿no? El cambio tiene que ser sistémico, tenemos que proponer literalmente un espacio distinto al que nosotros vivimos, ¿no? Y eso lo lleva haciendo la vía campesina desde sus territorios, organizadamente, desde la finca, desde la tierra, desde las comunidades, una alianza entre el campo y la ciudad, ¿no? Y para nosotros es muy importante dejar claro eso, porque a pesar de que jurídicamente tenemos todos estos monstruos, ¿verdad?, encima de nosotros, en los espacios, la gente está practicando otra cosa, ¿no? Y la gente sigue luchando, ¿no? Y para nosotros es bien importante dejar saber también que aquí ha habido mucha gente que ha muerto por estos temas, ¿no? Aquí hay gente que ha sido asesinada por reclamar el derecho a la tierra. En estos, en estos mismos días, en el presente, compañeros y compañeras en Brasil que simplemente por reclamar tierra pueden ser perseguidos y asesinados. Compañeros y compañeras en India... Que, que tienen una deuda por comprar semillas transgénicas que no la pueden pagar y terminan suicidándose, ¿no? Entonces nosotros tenemos que, que saber que esto es un problema real, que si verdaderamente venimos a hablar sobre el respeto de la, de la, de la madre tierra, tenemos que, que tocar estos temas. Bueno, por último, quería un poco para, para mencionarles sobre lo, los artículos y la declaración de los derechos de la madre tierra, 
Entendemos que el artículo 2.1, los derechos inherentes de la madre tierra, tienen pertinencia con lo que les hemos tratado de comunicar desde la vía campesina y, y desde Puerto Rico. El derecho a, con, a continuar sus ciclos vitales y procesos libres de intervenciones humanas. El derecho a no tener su estructura genética modificada o interrumpida de una manera que amenace su integridad o funcionamiento saludable y vital. El derecho a estar libre de contaminación tóxica o radioactiva. Y además las obligaciones de seres humanos con la madre tierra. Promover y apoyar prácticas para el respeto de la madre tierra y todos los seres, de acuerdo a sus propias culturas, tradiciones y costumbres. Y por último, ahí tenemos compañeros y compañeras, hace poco un compañero de Nicaragua, de la Asociación de Trabajadores del Campo, nos recordó citando a otro compañero de Brasil, que el pueblo que no produce lo que se come no es libre. Y otro compañero académico también menciona, el alimento es un arma en manos del imperio. ¿no? Por lo tanto, nosotros tenemos que tener claro cómo nos organizamos, qué nos proponemos, y esto es un espacio también que traemos para adelantar nuestros planteamientos. Y por eso, en Puerto Rico decimos, agroecología por el pueblo, por la vida y para siempre. Y en la vía campesina subrayamos, globalicemos la lucha, globalicemos la esperanza. Muchísimas gracias. I want to thank all of the presenters for your work, for your experience and your testimony before this tribunal. And um, I, I could ask this question of all of you, and I, I very much appreciated um, the, 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 the alternatives that were presented uh, that pertain to the, each particular piece of the puzzle that you are all holding in the places where you live. It's often said by proponents of free trade that you can't put the genie back in the bottle. And when it comes to free trade, one could argue that it is the position of, that this is the position of the UNFCCC. Uh, and while there was, there was a lot of discussion about um, alternatives in, in particular areas of production uh, or agriculture. Uh, I have a question that might be best uh, uh, addressed to Maud. And I'm really looking at, for, for the purpose of this case, can you describe an earth economy that is not governed by free trade and free trade agreements? And can we have a global economy that is in balance with the rights of nature? And Should we have a globalized economy at all? It was a very powerful question and a very difficult one to answer. This is what we're being told in the renegotiation of the North American Free Trade Agreement. As you know, President Trump wants it torn up. It's not that he's anti-trade, and we better get that straight. What he wants is not multilateral trade. He wants one-on-one -on -one where the United States is the, is the big guy on the block. So for NAFTA, he wants Mexico gone because he wants those jobs back. And then he wants all the resources from Canada. And so he's going to do this one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so that's, that, that nationalistic, uh, mis misogynistic, racist, um, turning inward form of being anti-trade is not, of course, what we're about. And it's extraordinarily important that we make a uh, <clears throat> very clear distinction. Um, and global, as there are many good things about globalization, this being one of them, this incredible presentations that we've had here with, from people all over the world and the movement that we're building for social and environmental justice and for Mother Earth is a globalized movement. The issues that we're dealing with here are economic globalization, where really starting in the 70s but coming to, fr to fruition in the 1980s, corporations and capital went global and it didn't want to be uh, tied to domestic laws anymore. And so globalization, economic globalization, meant um, corporate social responsibility, which I just think is a dirty word and <laughs> contradiction in terms, uh, but give us the right to make the decisions, let the market make all the decisions and everything will be good. And I turn to them and I say, really, well, how's it going for you? The United Nations now tells us that three quarters of the world's working age population is in what they call the precariat, 
after all the promises that all you know this this these markets and these free trade agreements would be so good for everyone three quarters of the world's working age population don't have access to good jobs no security no pensions they're at the whim of these corporations so we've done something terribly wrong and we have to write it so I think what we need to have is a dialogue about which pieces do we want to keep. Of course we trade. My country's a trading nation. We're not going to stop trading. We're not going to stop sharing. We're not going to stop um, the movement of goods and people. The question is who's, uh, under whose auspices are we doing these? And there are other examples. There are a number of countries in, in South America that came together to build a trade agreement that was based on human rights, the right to regulate, the right to pr protect public services, no investment investor state needed. Um, I've written quite a bit about it, as have others, because there are models around the world. And I, what we need to go back now and say is, for whom are we doing this? Of all the presentations we heard in this session, but all the presentations for two days have talked about local communities, the rights of local people, for dignity, for for security, for a future, and f and to and to be there, living in harmony with Mother Earth, and so the laws that we have must, and the agreements that we have must promote and protect that. Martin Luther King said, "Legislation may not change, may not um, change the heart, but it will restrain the heartless." We need the rule of law, and what we're doing with these free trade agreements is taking them and putting the laws in the hands of transnational capital. We have to start taking it back now, and there's never been a better moment. There's never been a better moment for us to have this dialogue. Do I have the exact wording for agreements? I've got some, but that's not the point. The point is that we have to have a dialogue saying, what do we, the people, what do we, the, the, the people of the earth, um, uh, need to do? And I feel very moved by this process because technically this tribunal you know, doesn't have a mandate from, you know, whatever, our governments or the UN or whatever, but we're a movement in progress and we're taking ourselves very seriously and we are building another world. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's amazing and remarkable and I deeply believe these free trade agreements and these big transnational corporations are going to go the way of the dinosaurs. Uh, thank you so much, Maud, uh, for that really excellent presentation. And I'm really pleased that uh, we were able to have a trade case in this tribunal. I think it's absolutely important that we make this link between uh, trade agreements and the rights of nature. And you've done a great job of doing that, as the entire uh, presentation and all the presenters did. Um, you said that we cannot be economically and politically literate unless we are trade literate. I thought that was a very profound uh, statement. And so my question to you, because you are a movement leader, you've led for many years and have so much experience, you know, what would your advice be to us regarding how we become trade literate, how we bring the trade issue back into focus for our movements, and just some practical levers for us to grab onto. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, that's an, Osprey, is an incredibly important uh, uh, question. I've raised this in a number of uh, venues recently where there have been activists and people have said, you know, guilty as charged. I know the person or two people in my country who are sort of experts and I trust them to know about it. And if they tell me I should come out to a, a, a you know, a, a protest or whatever, I'll do it. But I don't feel I have to know. And I think a lot of people feel these trade and investment agreements are too complicated for them and they're not. These trade agreements are organized greed, and they hide behind a lot of language that seems really complicated, but it's not. You can go to websites, certainly our website, canadians.org, if anyone wants to know the North American or the European Union. Um, the, uh, your work uh, with a group called Compact and a number of others here in Germany, there's wonderful information on all of these agreements. There's tremendous information on the Trans-Pacific Partnership from our movement. Just get yourself knowledgeable. Start reading and don't be intimidated by it. If we leave this to experts, even experts in our movement, and usually it's somebody in the lab local labor movement. Well, that person's following it, so I don't have to. We're just left, it's as if we're, I guess, have this image of us taking these little baby steps in our, in our work, and this stuff is just putting a constitutional framework over the work that we're doing. I mean, water, I didn't even give you this example. There was a case where an American pulp and paper company actually got money from a NAFTA challenge 
because they actually claimed, they left Newfoundland, where they had been operating for years, and left all the jobs, left all the pensions. They actually got money, $131 million, in compensation for the water rights we let, they left behind. Now, what does this mean? This means that any transnational corporation or any foreign investor, investor operating anywhere with, under one of these trade agreements, protected by them, can claim to own the local resources. Um, and if, if they needed them for their production. Well, think of the land grabs and the water grabs that we're dealing with in, in Africa alone, for instance, and the right of these corporations to say, I need that water, that belongs to me. So we're no longer saying it's not, it's not even local, it's not even national, this water is now corporately owned. And I think we need to follow that because you can turn around and think we did all the right things and all the right work, but this was going on. Uh, and it's, I've been in, in places and times when there was trade literacy. The Europeans, because of the uh, European-US deal, got very, very uh, trade literate. They had huge uh, events, hundreds of thousands of people at these uh, trade events, uh, trade protests, including the one with Canada. And it, so we need, we can do this when we need to. We've just kind of lost sight of it as a movement. And I, I was so keen to have this discussion here because I think you know, the work we're doing on climate and justice and everything else for Mother Earth is in competition. And if your government has signed a free trade agreement and signed the Paris Accord, it's the free trade agreement that it's going to be listening to. And we need, so if Trump pulls out and my government didn't, it's all the same. They're still not going to make uh, like a Paris commitment because they're on another trajectory and we, we're, not, we're not watching it. And I think when we come to the climate summit, I, I think we need to go back to bugging the WTO and you know, being of strepperous at some of these trade uh, negotiations. Um, thank you so much, Juan. I just wanted to, to just make a quick comment because uh, others have made this before as well, which is, you know, isn't it interesting that the that Paris Agreement is not binding, but they sure as heck make sure that the trade agreements are. It's extraordinarily important. There's no, when people say, oh, well, I'm the UN. The UN's not going to send an army in to make you do anything that you've agreed to. It is an ethical and moral commitment that our governments make, and then the citizens need to make sure their governments uh, meet it. Um, but there's huge, tremendous, Im uh, powerful impact uh, that the enforcement mechanisms in these trade agreements, both from the countries themselves but from the corporations, are unprecedented and they've been growing and growing as our movement, as, as basically the international agreements in other areas have, have been declining. So I think we, we just, we need to right that wrong. This is profoundly wrong and it needs to be raised at the climate summit here. Thank you. Thank you. I think there are no more questions.